Yes, so there are so much looking at my hundreds of questions and thinking there's just so many things to ask you and I must uh, let the audience ask theirs in a moment. But people can obviously, if they haven't already, read about all of the fascinating areas you go into in the book, but you're talking about male and female there. So one of the ever asked questions, particularly at the moment, there's been a sort of preponderance of literature about it is when we're looking at what's innate in our brain and what is environmental or a social contract, social construct what about the idea of a gendered brain do, do you think oh yes um so there's wonderful books out there that go into this in great detail um gina rippon from the university of birmingham yeah. professor, yeah. she's written a fantastic book um and there's also um anything by cadelia F um, fines in australia um but I want to touch on one study that's come out in the last few months, um, and this has been, this has involved Barbara Sahakian, who's at Cambridge University, but she's been working with scientists in Asia and also I think in America, and they've used three different data sets um, that combined brain scanning results from tens of thousands of people, tens of thousands of people. Um, and so we're looking at uh, brains from people from different cultures uh, and combining that analysis of those brain scanning images, looking at the human connectome. So looking at how those brains are connected up with each other. So actually, but I want to go back a step actually. So there is one finding that is um, repeatedly found um, in terms of gender differences in the brain. And that's that female brains are generally speaking smaller um, by about 100 grams, for example. But what's interesting about this is that size doesn't necessarily mean much because when you look at the brain, the, the way that it's connected um, allows for connections to occur in, in a way that compensates for the smaller size. And so the size doesn't really mean anything. And just one example of this is that Einstein had an unu really unusual, unusually small brain. So I think his brain was 1.2 or 1.1 kilograms. And yet he was um, fairly clever. Uh, so he didn't seem to cognitively lack because of his small size of his brain. So that's, so that's one finding, um, but it's not really linked to intelligence um, or different ways of thinking. Um, but what um, this study that looked at tens of thousands of results across the, the world um, found was they were looking at connectivity within these brains from these different people. And they found that the majority of brains, actually, so if we look at... Um, a spectrum of a very female brain and a very male brain, anatomically speaking. You find that the majority of people are actually here in the middle, this 50%, 50% of people within those tens of thousands of um, volunteers from around the world, they were in the middle in this very bulk here, 50% of people. And it was, and there was 25% here that had a very male brain and 25% here that had a very female brain. Now, really interestingly, those people that were in the middle were actually more, they had better cognitive abilities in terms of being able to think more collaboratively, to problem solve, to have a higher working memory problem. And really importantly, they also had um, a much higher resistance to mental ill health. They were less vulnerable to mental health problems down the line than these problems, these people here that had these very niche brains. Now, what we know based on plasticity is that the environment can actually shape the way that we see the world and shape the way that we interact with it. And the more the society seems to focus on gender, the more we're, we're probably pushing people to those extremes. And that's at the expense of our collaboratively, creatively problem solving, working together um, and having resilience against mental health problems. So really as a society, what we probably want to do is to, instead of nudging people that way and trying to split um, our brains in terms of gender and to divide actually what we should be doing really is just trying to treat people as individuals because really and I suppose this is what my book really is getting at from the beginning is that we are all individuals we've got these 86 billion nerve cells that we're given to us from our mums and from our dads and each one of those nerve cells has that DNA that's given to us from our mum and dad and there's epigenetic programs that shape the way that that DNA is shaped, that's handed on from our grandparents, from our ancestors. And that gives rise to this neural circuitry that we're born with when we enter the world. And then our experiences in life, um, which are largely dictated by our mum and dads and from um, our society, then go on to shape how these nerve cells, how these 86 billion nerve cells kind of connect up 
to form this 100 trillion uh, complicated circuit board with all these 100 trillions of connections. And that then goes on to give rise to our very individual and unique um, view of the world and will dictate how we shape it, how we interact with the world. Um, so we are each of us, because of the way that we have these permutations with the DNA, the epigenetics, the nerve cells, how they connect up, each one of us is very individual based on our experiences and our DNA and our epigenetic handovers. Um, and so perhaps it isn't, in some ways, it isn't useful to try and clump people into these like different conditions and actually start to appreciate that we each have our, you know, weaknesses and we each have our, or perceived idiosyncrasies and foibles, but we each have our strengths as well. Um, and perhaps we need to start seeing each other as individuals, just in the way that DNA has helped to give rise to this idea of very personalized medicine based on our DNA. Maybe we need to start seeing us each as our, our brains as being very individual as well. I just, just finally, as I say, so, so much to talk about. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. So many areas to go into, but one of the things that I sort of underlined and highlighted amongst many in your book was this idea you're talking about us as individuals, but one of the ways in which we form very steadfastly into groups is to do with our beliefs. And you surprise me again when you write about the idea that we could be sort of hardwired or physically, biologically conservative or liberal in our beliefs. That's, to me, I thought that's something that comes as we make judgments on the world, as we, as we live our lives, as we live our experiences, as we mix in different social groups. But some experiments have shown that actually biologically, your brain could be wired differently if you're conservative. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. So yes, I'm glad you asked this. Um, fascinating to me. <laughs> yeah, this, I mean, this really fascinates me as well. And maybe, but maybe we shouldn't be quite so surprised about it. Um, so there's some wonderful work uh, that again has come out fairly recently. Um, but the, the biggest study in this area looks at 12,000 twin pairs over five democracies sampled over the course of four decades. So that's quite a large study. And what they found is that there's a 30% heritability, so a 30% genetic predisposition for people based on whether they're going to be, um, people call it different things in different countries, which I'm aware of in Australia. So whether people are gonna be more of the um, kind of right political ideology or of uh, the, the kind of further left political ideology. And there's thousands of these genes that work in tandem. So 30% heritability, which is quite a large amount. Um, and then there's another study that looked at one of these particular genes, the dopamine 4, 7R receptor, the 7R LL of this gene. So again, we're looking at dopamine, which is a um, chemical that's involved in these feelings of reward, pleasure, and motivation. And it works within the nucleus accumbens, this area of the brain that I talked about earlier. And there's a lovely study that looked at how the genes and the environment can interact to give rise to your political ideology, this very complex behavioral traits within us. Um, so they looked at this one particular gene and what they found is that those people uh, that had a higher number of friends that were exposed to a greater um, kind of spread of uh, socioeconomic groups within their early years, so when they were quite young, um, and they had this particular genetic variation, they were much more likely to be of the liberal political ideology. And for those that didn't have this genetic uh, variant of the 7R dopamine receptor, um, they didn't have any association. So there's a key thing here. There's a link between the genes and the number of friends that you have that are spread across um, uh, socioeconomic status that seems to give rise to your um, ideological behavior later on in life. Um, and there's another study that's been done in this area that took 90 adults um, and then analyzed the size of particular areas of the brain, including the amygdala and the interior cingulate cortex. Um, which is an area of the brain. So the amygdala is involved in the fear response, which I told you about earlier in the mice, and the anterior cingulate cortex is involved in monitoring uncertainty and being flexible in terms of collaboratively problem solving. And what they did using this um, imaging data is they were able to then um, accurately predict uh, the political bent of individuals based on their brain scanning um, data. And they were then able to independently replicate this in, an, in a different sample of people with 72% accuracy. So it does seem as though, although our political leanings might not be 100% biologically kind of bestowed to us uh, based on our DNA and our epigenetics, perhaps even, 
um, there is a, a high heavy uh, element to how our ideology is pre-wired and this interplays neatly with our environment and our early years experiences. Um, so I am going to move to audience questions because we've got a few minutes left um, but of course people can now go away and understand what we can essentially you know do about that it doesn't mean that minds can't be changed essentially you know we can't be moved away from core beliefs that are, are, that you're talking about but there's all sorts of fascinating questions there and i'm going to move on to, on to the um audience questions one of them i think is really important it's something you reference in the book and you've mentioned education but somebody asked as a head teacher in an inner city school in london how information that you've talked about can be used to change generational underachievement Um, I, th I think in, in the book you, you talk about very interesting about like um, how of the way in which education and intelligence um, you know is in, in terms of epigenetics in terms of social it's not just biological so those things need to be changed with this understanding. Yeah exactly I mean one of the most robust findings and if we're looking just at intelligence scores which are limiting in themselves in terms of IQ tests as teachers I'm sure are aware um, but if we just look at IQ scores, the most robust replical finding for how we can boost IQ for people is to keep them in school. So when there was an Educational Welfare Act that um, made it mandatory for people to stay within schools for an extra year or two, the IQ level of that, of that cohort of students compared to previous years actually raised on average by about five points which doesn't sound like a colossal amount but it is a colossal amount it can have a, a, a big impact on those people's lives so the most important thing here is um, staying in education um, for as long as possible really in terms of IQ the other point uh, is that so there's been lots of studies looking at the Mozart effect you know like playing Mozart to children for example um, and that has been uh, largely quashed. So that research wasn't kind of replicated. And, and there was a, um, a, a governor in, um, in California, I think it was, who was actually starting to give out Mozart CDs to all expectant mothers, insisting that they play Mozart to their babies in the womb to raise their IQ and to help boost the next generation. But that, so that, those results have actually been quashed and that's not been replicated at all. Um, Although music can definitely have some effects on the brain and particularly for those that have um, dyslexia, for example, it's been found that trying to link up the auditory cortex um, through rhythm and through music and through dance can help with the reading ability and concentration. Um, but one finding that has been really interesting recently is access to green space. So access to green space um, for children from any socioeconomic um, group, um, from seemingly any genetic background, um, can help boost that IQ again by about two or three points on average. So these are studies that have come out of England, um, but also uh, replicated in other areas of Europe as well. Um, yeah, but I don't know whether that was a particular mm -hmm. help, but it's anything that can be done to really help motivate the children and help instill in them a love of learning and an enjoyment of learning. And whether that's using educational apps. So for my son, for example, he's loving doing using reading eggs, which is, you know, a, a, a fantastic game, a fantastic platform that he uses on his tablet and he'll sit there for half an hour and it's and it's and he, he's not allowed any other screen time, but he really enjoys that and that's really helped um, with his learning. I think any tools that can help boost that motivation for young children. A few people asking about um, autism and um, Madalena asks, in children that have autism, to what extent can we support the enhancement of these neural collections and the connections in the brain or increasing plasticity? So there's been some lovely studies that are, that are looking at... Um, uh, okay, so, so I kind of want to move back a little bit from that question and go back to the political ideology that I talked about earlier. So those people are, that are on the... Um, far right extreme and those people that are of the more liberal persuasion. Now, both people are actually quite important for society. So those people that are in the, that vote more conservative might have a hyperactive amygdala, for example, and they might have a less active or um, anterior cingulate cortex. 
And that biological brain profile will mean that they are more aware of immediate threats through that hypervigilant amygdala. Um, and those people that are voting on a more liberal persuasion will have an enhanced um, insula and enhanced anterior cingulate cortex, which means that they're more able to monitor uncertainty and tolerate uncertainty and to think about collaboratively problem solving and horizon problem solving into the future. Now, both people are, types of people are important in terms of making sure that the here and now is safe and that actually, but also looking forwards, we can innovate collectively as a species and work together. So both types of people are important and it's important to have both um, types of people within our society. If we now look at um, autism, for example, now if we, there's a wonderful guy called Gene Robinson who works in America. And what he found is that he analyzed um, some bees who were in a hive and he found that um, he genetically analyzed them and he found that there was some, a subpopulation of genes that had um, some of the genes for, that predisposed to autism they had homologs for these within this subpopulation of genes. And um, the behavior of these autistic bees, they weren't autistic bees, but you know, these genes that were predisposed towards a type of autism tendency, the behavior of these bees meant that when a real calamity, a real drama hit that hive, like for example, the queen dying or relocation having to occur because of some environmental factor, then these autistic bees, they're not autistic bees, they were able to just pragmatically get on with the tasks in hand and not get caught up in the emotional drama of what was going on within the hive. And so keep the essence, the core essence of the hive ticking over during that period of um, calamity and drama. So, so that's actually quite an essential part of, of any society's function, functioning, whether it's within a hive or whether it's within um, a human um, society, for example. Um, so all types of people are important for our society and our culture to tick along and to run. Um, uh, so when we're talking about children with autism, obviously there are um, positives that autism can bring. Um, but in terms of helping that individual to develop their emotional recognition of other people, um, then there have been some studies that are showing that just simple experiments, like for example, looking at expressions of people on different, um, with their faces and playing games, like for example, you know, what expression am I pulling now? Or, or just doing different faces and, and, and enacting different faces and seeing if you can start to learn, start to learn how different facial expressions correlate with different emotional states inside and what that might mean in terms of what that person is trying to um, communicate. So there's different exercises that you can do to try and help bolster those skills. And perhaps this is something that exercises that we should all be doing as well, actually. <laughs> can I ask you, I know it's, and I said, it's really, do you have time for one more question, even though I've got, gone over? Are you, you could say no, yeah. it's gone over. Uh, I just, fine. You talk about resilience in the book and somebody asks, is courage and bravery inherited? Hmm. I don't know about courage and bravery specifically. I don't know any studies that spring out of my mind particularly about that. There have been some studies. So we probably all know somebody who may have um, experienced really horrific events early in their life. Um, and they had a lot of trauma, but they seem to have just whatever life throws at them, they seem to get over it and be very positive and to move forwards in life in a really, you know, amazing way. And this positivity seems to emanate from them. You know, what, and we probably all have somebody in, in our lives that's like that. And maybe we'd like to be a little bit like them. Um, well, when we look again, this is studies um, that have come out of, there's one particular researcher Anna Laura um, Van Hermelen, who's um, uh, in the Netherlands researching there. Um, and she's looking at the neurobiology of resilience. And there's particular genetic uh, differences that appear to be in these super resilient people um, who might be, you might think maybe they're brave or maybe they've got a particular amount of courage. Um, and what, what we can learn from them is that they might have brains that express high levels of BDNF, which is brain derived neurotrophic factor, which is this lovely little chemical, which basically helps new nerve cells to be born in the brain throughout our life and helps those nerve cells to then connect up to form this beautiful connecting flourishing brain that's highly plastic and can change in, in response to its environments. So basically high levels of BDNF 
great. You've got a really happy brain. Yeah, it's like a brain that's got, it's an allotment that's been um, sprinkled with lots of fantastic rainwater, that's beautiful rainwater and lots of um, fertilizer has been added to it. So you want lots of BDNF. Okay, so what can we learn from these people that express high levels of BDNF naturally? Is there anything that we can do to also similarly cultivate this beautiful brain? There are. So we can, for example, exercise lots, um, interact with lots of other people to try and integrate their different world points of view to enhance our plasticity. Um, be challenged by people and be challenged by trying to learn new things. You know, talk to people that have got different worldviews to you um, and constantly learn new things and make yourself um, exercise in order to enhance this BDNF levels within our brain. So that's one way. Um, there's also, uh, in terms of courage and bravery, it makes me think of people that might have um, genetic profiles for ADHD, for example, which again is linked back to this dopamine um, chemical in the brain and how it reacts um, and those people with ADHD are sometimes more likely to be entrepreneurs so they may be uh, they might be maybe more prone to be um, slightly more impulsive and take more risks and are involved in innovation so again we need these types of people within our brain within our society uh, and you can see different brain profiles and different genetic profiles associated with these traits it makes it's completely not surprising to me, of course, given this sort of extraordinary nature of the brain that an hour and 10 minutes has gone by and there is still an explosion of things to talk about and to ask. So maybe what we're going to have to do part two, perhaps like um, another time and ask you back just to carry on with all the other things to talk about. But um, for now, I feel like I should let you probably go back to bed. Um, it's, so, it's so early there. But thank you so very much. For joining us and, and you know people can read about the parts we didn't get to of course in, in your book and thank you everybody very much indeed for being there and thank you for your great questions i'm sorry if i didn't get to them all thank you bye bye